I'm Kerry Stinson, and my journey through life has been quite an adventure. For over 20 years, I played Barney the Dinosaur on tour and seven seasons of the hugely popular TV show, Barney and Friends. Now my journey is to bring together friends and guests from all over the entertainment world for inspiring and at times amusing behind the scenes conversation. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this is Purple Roads. Welcome to another episode of Purple Roads. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this is going to be fun this week. We're going to the UK. This is a gentleman that I worked with years ago and just had such a wonderful experience. And he's back on TV again. And so this is Derek Evans, known as Mr. Motivator. Derek, how are you? I am too fabulous for words. <laughs> you know, when you're the best looking man in the UK, it is a problem, you know. <laughs> you know, you look no different than when we worked all those years together. And I remember you were fabulous there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, you know, the thing is, I, I believe that if you look after yourself and as the years roll by, so you will be reaping the rewards of doing so. You know, it, it's so important to have you on right now with what's going on in the world. Yes. Um, you, you, you know, I'm smiling. You, you keep people's attitudes and obviously their bodies um, healthy. Um, what, what's this experience been like uh, going it's, through COVID? Yeah, you know what? I, the way I view things is this, is that every single one of us have hurricanes that happen in our lives. A broken relationship, you lose a job, you break a leg, you're in hospital. Uh, we've all had it in our lives. And, and so there's a duration that all those hurricanes last. And all we know is that you do get better, right? You do hope and right. you, you work towards getting better. And I believe that the, the pandemic is no different to one of those hurricanes that we're gonna have to learn to cope with and we are learning to cope with and and what these hurricanes do they give you the kind of building blocks for who you become in the end and you learn from it and then you go on i mean there's no doubt that once we've gone through this and come out the other side when it comes again and come again it must we'll all be better prepared either mentally but definitely physically because we would have learned so many lessons so where did you learn this attitude, this positive attitude to deal with these tough times in life? I, I learned, you know, the university of life is a wonderful thing. You can go to as many universities as you like, get all your doctorates, get your professorship and come out the other end and you're as stupid as hell. <laughs> true, but, when, true. Right, but when you go through the university of life, that means you've lived it. Right, then right. you can speak passionately about it. And for me, you know, I can talk about being being homeless. I can talk about being a one parent family and looking after my daughter on my own. I can speak about the times when jobs fell apart. I can talk about the times when you go to a job and the guy doesn't want to employ you because your face doesn't fit at that time. I can talk about all those things. But the way I see it is I have a choice in life. And a choice is one of those wonderful blessings that sometimes we we totally underestimate. Can you imagine the having how blessed you are to have a choice? Just imagine that. You have a choice whether we talk together, whether we have a breakfast, whether we wash our hands for 20 seconds. There's some people in the world who have to make a decision between washing their hands for 20 seconds or drinking the water. We don't even have that choice. So how blessed are we? So when you go through all these experiences, you come out richer for it, right? And, and, so, and so therefore, I know that for every minute that I'm sad, unhappy, angry, I'm missing out on 60 seconds of happiness. So I choose happiness every time. Do you, do you ever have those moments where you get, you get pulled down and you got to remind yourself to, to get out? Not now, because of the <laughs> foundation stones of what I've gone through. And I realize that there's no saying that when your cup of happiness is full, some idiot always wants to nudge your elbow. That's because they're either jealous or they don't like the fact that you're getting all the goodness, right? Um, so if you're in a great space, there's always someone wants to pull you down to, the, to their level. And I don't let it. So I start the day right every day. And when I get up, I do focus on all the things that I'm blessed, I'm blessed with, whether it's just the fact I was able to get out of bed is a blessing. Right, right. Yeah? <laughs> the mere fact I can see, I can hear, right? I can, um, I can tell someone I love them. I can cuddle my daughter. I can hold her, my wife's hand. Uh, all these things are wonderful blessings. And I think the sooner we all recognize those blessings and realize that 
if you recognize and give out positive energy to other people, you get it back in so many ways. It, it's so it's so true. You know, both of us have been so blessed to be able to help people and and to work um, work with people and and spread that positivity and that Absolutely. that love. Um, you do a lot of charity work as well. Yes. Why is it so important to you? You know, there was a time when things were really tough. And there was a time when, in fact, getting the next meal was really tough. And it's the toughest time when you, when you have to beg. And I remember going along to the, um, the labor office when I was out of work. And the way I was treated when I went in, I kind of hated it. And I said to the lady, I said, I will never come in here again. And after that, I decided, you know what? Let me just work hard. And in working hard, I'll always remember the first week after being on television in 1993, I walked into a restaurant and I ordered some food. And at the end of it, the proprietor said to me, you don't have to pay for this. And I said to him, no, 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 come on. He said, no, 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 no. He said, I've been watching you all week on television and you bring me joy. And really, I decided after that, you know what, when it comes to handing out and paying forward, I just think it's a great thing to do because I've had it come back to me in so many ways. And when you give out positivity and you give out love and joy and, and a smile which takes no effort, it, it, it comes back to you when you least expect it. It may not always come back to you personally, but it can come back to your, your siblings, it can come back to someone you know really well, but it does. And so for me, I work with charities all the time, even through the lockdown, I've been doing these charity workouts where staff in various companies who have not been able to go back to work, I'll do a workout for them. They pay a fee and that goes straight into the charity. Only last night I did one for a charity called Mind, which is a mental illness charity. who have had tremendous problems in raising funds during the lockdown. Um, and also when you, when you talk about mental illness, a lot of families don't want to address it don't want to ever acknowledge it. And I believe, in fact, if I can give a platform or support the platform by doing that kind of work, then it's going to pay dividends. Why do you think mental illness is something that we just don't want to talk about? We don't want to deal with. We kind of want to sweep it under the rug. There's always been derogatory terms used for anybody who has mental illness. And that's often because we don't understand it, right? We don't understand that, that sometimes the pressures of life Right. can get to all of us differently. Some of us, the beginning of mental illness can be you just getting a pain in the back of your neck, right? Which then starts yeah. transferring up to your head or you can't sleep at night and people don't relate it to being a mental problem, right? But, but the thing is, right, that's what, that's what can happen. And, and the more you look into it, you realize we're all bordering on that point at which we could easily get pushed over the edge. We could easily find that we can't manage in a particular circumstance. And I, so, so I think it's important to, to keep saying to people that, look, the more you talk about it, the better you're going to feel. The more you, um, you're not afraid to say what it is, it, it, uh, it becomes easier as you go along. And I, so, so, so my whole role is to try and, I believe, encourage people to talk about it. And last year, I was going around a lot of the BBC studios, just talking to all the staff about recognizing when someone maybe just needs someone to talk to. It's that guy sitting in the court corner who maybe is just desperate for someone to say, would you like to go and have a cup of tea? Would you like to go and go for a walk? You know, and, and if we do that, it gives people the opportunity to realize that you know, you, there is a listening ear there. There is someone who, who will pay attention and give you a bit of time because sometimes that's all people need is just a little bit of time. Yeah, I think that is, is really true and, and really important. And I, I think we're all seeing right now, I, yeah. we're getting pushed mentally um, we're dealing with stuff we've just never dealt with before. And I think that part has been just such a challenge and, and we don't see, see an ending in this. Um, no. As much as the physical part is important, how, how do you help people um, to keep that positivity in this challenging time? Well, well, you know, the thing is, right, every single person has to take responsibility at some stage for who you are and what you are and where you want to go in life, okay? All we can ever hope to do is to give them the ammunition and the information so that they can then make a decision themselves. A bit like everybody knows if they're overeating. Right. They know what it's like to have actually drunk too much. 
So they don't need me to say to them, listen, cut back on your portions or don't drink that other drink. They know. And equally, when it comes to um, something not being right, very often, right, we're in denial half the time. Right. And that denial is the obstacle that stops us actually seeking help going forward or doing something about our situation. So all we can do with people, I mean, I've, I'll always, and I've repeated the story a couple of times. I remember this lady writing to me and she said, um, you know what, I've been right near the edge. I've just, I just don't know what to do. I don't know what, what, what I'm gonna do because this lockdown is really getting to me. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I said to her, look, our life is like a white sheet of paper. And I'm gonna show you an, an example. It's a white sheet of paper. And in the middle of that sheet of paper, there's a dot. So you say to yourself, you say to anybody, well, what do you see when you look at that? And all people ever see is that little black dot. But the rest of it is us. Right. That's all, that's, that's all us. Look how great that is. So that's only 0.01%. And yes, still we give it so much attention Right? And we make that be the stumbling block to why we progress. Because what we haven't done is just recognize how blessed we are with all those other things. Right. So there's only four things. So let me just quickly go through. The first thing is, have you got a roof over your head? Second thing is, do you have food in the fridge? Third thing is, do you have your health? And the fourth thing is, do you have someone you love who loves you? Even if it's only you loving you, do you have that? Because if you have those four things, you're exceedingly rich. Now, as you look around you, how many people out there don't necessarily have food in the fridge, don't have a roof over their head? She said, you know what? You're absolutely right. I've got everything to live for. What it is, I've been pursuing too many things on the edges, like the extra car and the extra television set and that other suit that you can't possibly wear. Right. And, uh, and so when you break it down like that, it makes people realize that, look, having those four things, you are rich as, as ever. I think sometimes it just takes someone to point that out, though. Don't we? We just get so within ourselves that, as you're saying, and we miss that. Yeah. Um, I mean, Kerry, you know, I get so many, um, so much mail from people who are asking for help. And I'm no trained psychologist or whatever it is. As I said to you, I've only lived through the University of Life. Right. Two weeks ago, I do a, every Saturday morning, I do a Zoom class, right? And it's, Mm. it's technically... It's kind of free for everybody. Those who can pay, pay a little bit. And right. most of them give away anyhow. All right, I do it at 10 o'clock because it keeps my hand in because I do a lot of these huge music festivals mm-hmm. where I'm the first act to come on to get everybody going. So you'll have 10, 15, 20,000 people moving and some of the images are, are just great. Right. So she, she joined one the class on a Saturday and she said, look, it's Friday evening. I don't think I could come to class tomorrow. Because my husband came in and after 10 years, he said to me, I'm leaving. And he packed his bags and he left. And I was there with the kids. And she says, I have no reason to smile. I've got no reason to live. My world has come to an end. So I said to her, look, just think about it. Try the class because it might be just good for you to switch off for 30 minutes. She did the class. She wrote to me afterwards. She said, when I started the class, I had no reason to smile. But at the end of it, my jaws were aching from laughing so much because that's how I, how I teach. For me, I'm not into busting a gut. I'm into actually just having one big laugh about it, right? Yeah. Um, so I wrote back to her and I said, in life, sometimes good things have to fall apart so that better things may fall together. So, so I said that again. <laughs> yeah, you should good say that things, again. Good things fall apart sometimes so that better things can fall together. So though initially we're hurt and we're aching and the, you know, the pandemic is around, those hurricanes are around, look at it as being a learning and what it does, better things are due to come. And when I did that, she wrote back and she said, you know what, I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to keep on fighting the good fight and, uh, and I'm going to look after my kids and I'm going to look forward to better times ahead. That's all we've got to do. It sounds so simple. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> so simple. So, you know, there's a, there's a joke out there that during this COVID-19, people have gotten the COVID-15, which is, is picking up 15 pounds. They, they've just mindlessly been eating. What, what's the recommendation? How do you get them off the couch, get them outside, get them moving again? 
Well, I think it's, it's, it's again, it's the usual thing that is creating awareness. A lot of, lot of, we know, right, that we need to move. We know. Right. If you've been sitting now for a long period of time, we know how stiff we get. Everybody right. knows, right? So I think the important thing is during the lockdown, and for you in America, that lockdown is going to come. It's going to come to the point oh, where it's... you're going to have to close the whole place down for three weeks to get on top of it, which is what we have done here. Closed it down. Right? And now we're reopening. And of course, we now can now open up more control. But the one thing I said to everybody is this, is that every day you've got to get up with a purpose. So don't stay in your pajamas. Don't stay in your night dress. Right? Get dressed for action. Yeah. Okay? So if you want to be active, put your trainers on first thing in the morning as you get up. Put a baggy t-shirt on. Because for some reason, when you've got your trainers on, for some reason you want to move. It's very different to having slippers on. Right. Next thing is, make sure there's music playing in the house. And if the old man or the lady or whatever it is don't like your kind of music, get your headphones on, <laughs> your head banging music. All right? So every time you hear that music, you're going to want to move. Because remember, you have 650 muscles in your body. And your muscles love work. If you have an animal, you would never leave it locked up. You would always want to take it outside. Well, we're animals. We've got more muscles than a dog. So come on, let's exercise those muscles. And then what you do is you set yourself realistic goals. And just the action of getting up out of the chair and sitting back down is an exercise. So if you, cut, if you stand up and you go, oh, that, that really kind of ached a bit, do it a few times. If you do it a few times, you're on your way. Think about everything that you have to do to survive it can be turned into an exercise, whether it's you're having a drink, you're moving your bicep muscles. That's an exercise. Right. You want your jumper is an exercise because it's awkward. You've got to get your hands through the sleeve. That's an exercise. Do it a few times. Get a, get a cushion. Put it between your thighs. Squeeze it together a few times and hold it. That's an exercise for your inner and outer thighs. Squeeze your butt cheeks together and hold it. And imagine that it's the lift door in the supermarket store that you can't get to. So you've closed the lift door. You're going up to the first floor. Keep it closed. Second floor. Keep it closed. Ten floor. Now let it out. All of a sudden, you can feel those muscles working. The other thing is to change your outlook on life. The first thing you want to do is imagine that there is an orange between your shoulder blades. Squeeze the juice out of the orange by pushing your shoulder blades together. It changes your whole, the way in which you, you walk, the way in which you stand, the way in which you look at the world. This is no way of looking at the world. That is, that's you in command. So we don't have to go to a gym. We don't have to actually have these special exercise regimes. We don't have to do any of those things. All we have to do is turn everything that, is, that keeps us alive every day, turn it into an exercise routine that we just do. I'm just plugging this in to make sure we don't run out of battery. <laughs> well, you know, another thing, and we will definitely have links for people to see if they've never seen you before sure. working out. I can send you some stuff. I'd love that because people need to see this. I've yeah. had the pleasure of working out with you, but uh, in a big purple costume. But I think one of the other things that's so important, and you're seeing it through this interview, is how much fun you have. You make, you make working out fun. <laughs> Thank you. But I think that's the whole idea. You know, the thing is the doctor hitting you with a big stick saying you must, you must, you must is no way to engage anybody to get up. But if you can dress up the, the pill of exercise and health and well-being in a kind of sugary coating, which is kind of strange because you want to keep them off sugar. But let's say you can dress up into, what is it? Um, an ounce of um, sugar makes the med medics medicine go down. Yes. It's the same principle. And, you know, I, I, an idol of mine is Maya Angelou. Mayor yeah, Angelou says, people may forget what you say. They may even forget what you did, but they won't forget how you make them feel. And that's always been my kind of mantra. It's a, it's a, if I can make you feel good, and if in my voice I sound really exciting about talking about health and wellness, I believe that's the way in which you engage the young and the not so young. Because you've got to say to them, listen, it's manageable. Right now, sitting down where you are, you can exercise without almost not moving. You can just tense up your body and auto automatically you're working your muscles. You know, I get people, as the weather closes in, they have problems with arthritis. Thank God I'm blessed. I'm 67 and I have none of those ailments, none of it. But what I do, 
all my joints are exercise and move them continually. I'm, I'm on the go. I'm like a energizer bunny. I believe I'm only 12 years of age. Remember this, you only get old when you stop being young. I ain't got to stop. I'm 12 year, years of age. You know, I, I love this because I actually think you have more energy than when I met you the first. <laughs> oh, sure. years ago. I'm fitter now than I ever was because you know what it is? I'm not just physically fit. I am mentally, emotionally fit because there are certain pillars that hold us up, Kerry. One of them is your emotional fitness, your physical fitness, your financial fitness, your mental fitness. But I maintain the emotional one is the most important because you know if your heart has just been busted, you can't sleep, you can't eat, you can't do anything. But when you're in love and everything feels good, and I celebrated my 24 year anniversary on Sunday, just gone. Congratulations. Right? Years ago, thank you. Um, when you, when you, if your emotions are out of place, it disturbs everything else. You can't work, work to get your finances in order. Physically, you go to the gym or go for a walk, and really, you're just not for it. And so it goes on. Mentally, it affects you. So I maintain the most important thing is our emotions. And that doesn't mean you have to particularly be in a relationship with someone else. Who you love, that's your business. But I believe it all starts with loving yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it's interesting. So many people, when they get in those states, they go to alcohol or they go to, to these substances. Yes. When I think you're pointing out that that's not needed at all. And in, in <laughs> fact, it's probably going to hurt you. It's not going to take away the pain. No, no, it doesn't. But then you see the thing is loneliness is a real, plays a real factor. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I, I remember reading somewhere once where it said, have you ever had the situation where you've walked away from someone and you feel like you've been in the longest conversation with them? My wife and I don't have to be speaking every minute. But when we speak, it feels like we have been talking for such a long time. We've never argued in the 30 years we've known each other. Why? Because I recognize that there, if I'm just a bit more understanding, you can preempt when something's gonna cause annoyance. And often, often sometimes, you shouldn't be fighting always to be the winner of an argument. Sometimes it can be great to just say, you know what, I think you're right. And when you go away and think about it, you normally find out your other half is right anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you find though that a lot of times it's ego it's hard for us to admit that we oh, make mistakes sure. or that we're wrong how could how can i be wrong sure i mean look i have the biggest ego in the world but mine is all about the fact i think i look good i think i'm fabulous i think i look i am so blessed here's how blessed i am if you go onto twitter and look and i i don't really do a lot on twitter yeah there's never anything negative anyone says about me go on to instagram which is real mr motivator on instagram and I post out these motivational stuff every day. There has never been anybody who has said, get him off, clear off, whatever. I've never had anything negative on those. I've never had to block anybody, nothing. Now, why does that happen? I believe that when you are well known, there's a couple of ways you can be. You can be yourself, that way people get to know you, or you can create this mystique where you're never available. I, there is never an email that comes in, no matter who it's from, that I don't respond to. A guy's just written to me, he's bipolar, he's put on, he's 30, 30 stones in weight, which is about 280 pounds. He's begging for help. He says he's affecting his relationship. I will always find time to, to go, to speak to everybody. I know it takes up a lot of my time, but I believe in making time. Yeah? Well, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we've talked about this before, especially with, with kids, but really with everyone, the importance of authenticity. Yes. You are exactly who, you know, what you see on TV is what you are in person. Same, same guy. I, I, the New York Times um, in April called me, said that the BBC had found their comfort food. I, I, so I'm like your, um, your McDonald's. <laughs> in England, I'm like your um, cheese and pickle sandwich. Right? That's what, <laughs> but, you know, but when we talk about people, you know, having issues and going to substance, I, all I can say is this, and it's something that I, I, I read and really believe, and that is we should all try not to prejudge anyone until we have walked a mile in their shoes and see what they see, experience what they experience, hear what they hear, 
And once we've done that, only then can we say, well, maybe I'm partially starting to understand why people either are the way they are and behave the way they are. So let's all try and walk a mile in the other person's shoes before we prejudge them. You know, th those are such important words. You know, we're going through not only COVID, but obviously we're having <laughs> racial yeah. issues here. And, and, and it's all down to that, right? Understanding yeah. people. Yes, it is. And, and, and the fact that we all need to work together, I think we've learned that more than ever. Yeah, but you know, Kerry, it's, it's, it's so strange. And I mean, I've been asked about this. You know, when I started on television, I remember being told that, look, you know, um, I'm sorry, a black man doing fitness on television would never work. It had to be a white lady with, with two kids. Mm -hmm. um, it took me 10 years to break into it. But the price of success is perseverance. I don't wait for my ship to come in. I swim out to it. But equally, there are people out there today who are against someone of color who have been into hospital recently and needed a blood transfusion and the blood they gave came from a black person and they didn't realize. So we need each other. We need each other. Why are, why are, yeah, that's the, the million question, right? Why, but, but why are people resistant to that? Because, you know, obviously I was, I was available with Barney who loved everyone. That was a message back in, you know, in the late eighties and nineties that we were, we were pushing. And, yes. and I think you, you find goodness, you're missing out on an opportunity to not go meet people and to help people and, and limit yourself. Why are people afraid to open up to everyone? Why do they limit themselves? I, Kerry, I don't understand ignorance. I just don't understand it, right? Because a lot of it is ignorance. And uh, to think that you're better than someone else, you know, there's no saying, you know, don't look down on someone because one day you could be the person looking up. Right? And I think it's more that, that we need to actually be prepared for. And sometimes there's a fear in people because they don't understand. And ignorance is a great, it's that kind of great barrier. Um, and everyone needs to just kind of learn from the history of the things of the past and realize how much contribution has been made by someone who maybe is not the same color as yourself. And then when you see the contribution that they've made, you realize how valuable they are to your everyday existence, right? And if you yeah. took away everyone of color, right now, if you took away everyone from color in America, you could fall flat on your face. Oh, well, absolutely. It, you know, the problem I have with this is to me, this is so simple. I just don't understand. I, I can't, not I can't, loving everyone. I, I just I, don't get it. Well, I can't figure it. I mean, if you took away black people out of sport, in every sport except ice skating, <laughs> it, it'd, be, it'd be gone, right? All right, we're not very good at swimming. Black people don't like swimming. I hate it, right? But you go basketball, motor racing. I mean, in the UK, we've got Hamilton, who's won his six times he's become... The, the champion basketball they're all black i mean majority is black people right. you know um and so it goes on athletics and so it goes on they we know we all can bring joy to each other just embrace it just that's all we have to do uh, i think it's important that what we all do is we try to inspire others so that one day you know someone will just look back at you and go you know because of you i didn't quit i kept going yeah and and i want to talk about that where did you learn not to accept no, that you just kept going? Because obviously that door was shut to you so many times. You know, I, I tell you when I learned. The one thing for sure is that you go in with an idea. And in television, we see it all the time. You go in with an idea and the people in front of you go, nah, that won't work. It's just not right. But people change. Right. Things change. They move on. So if you give up, and don't keep on going back to that same table. You're going to miss out when the new people come in who are more receptive to your idea. So for me, I just keep on going and keep on going. I mean, I've, listen, I, I, I will just do something else. Go around the back route to get in through the door. Find a way in which I can sneak in through the side door. Because remember, opportunity knocks but once. But disappointment leaves on the doorbell. Yeah. So I just keep on going. And don't accept no. Never.
Calm. You, I don't you know, you make it sound easier than it is sometimes, though, right? Or maybe yeah. it's just, you just can't. I mean, it's just it, right? <laughs> it's your DNA. It is who you are. Yeah, my DNA is never to give up. You know, as I said, when I was hungry, yeah. and my daughter was on my arm, and we were sitting outside the homeless family unit, I still believe that the right job will come along. I would get into that job, and I would grow fast through it. But every time I got a new job, I made sure I had something else I was doing. So just in case that fell flat, I had a pillow that I could fall on. And that's how it is, even right now. I mean, through this pandemic, what's happened is that I came, I was in Jamaica, I came in in March. And when I arrived, I was due to appear at 16 music festivals, huge, great big festivals wow. across the whole country and in Europe. And as I say, I go on stage and I, I'll send you some images of, of those and they're great. Can't wait to see and, uh, and you get thousands of people just arriving just to come and work out with me. And it's not a workout, it's just me messing around with them. Sure. So they got canceled. Then I had um, lots of uh, sales conferences and to go and speak to because I, I often go in, I go in at the one thirty hour when people are falling asleep and then I go in bang with music and I say, come on now guys, you're working for that company. They love you. They want to make sure you survive. You can survive. You can do it. I really kind of lift the whole spirits up. So that way when the MD stands up, they all are awake and they're listening to him. So all that was going on, canceled. But what's happened is I was sitting here thinking, what shall I do? So I thought, you know what? Let me offer to some of these companies the opportunity to have for their staff who are all over the place now, we'll pull them together on Zoom. I will do a 12 minute exercise regime called my daily dozen. 12 daily dozen for 12 minutes, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so I started and then we'd finished off with a 12 minute talk on how do you cope with the stress of what's happening and stuff like that. The very first client I had was Cabris. And from them, they booked me twice to come and do it. Then I've had Talk Talk, I've had Kellogg's and name it, all these companies. That are, so I picked up a brand new market purely because we're locked down. And the interesting thing is this, it's a bit like the guy who sells umbrellas. All year it's been dry. Right. The rainy month comes along and he runs out of umbrellas. He wishes he'd actually bought a load and was sitting in the garage. With me, I wish there was two of me because right <laughs> now I could do with two of me to be able to cope with the demand. But you know, isn't it interesting? I think we've learned to be creative. <coughs> and you're, you're seeing through this time that some people figure it out and other people yeah. kind of woe is me. Yeah, because they're waiting for their ship to come in and that's right. no answer. You know, right now is everyone's got the opportunity. In America, if you're sitting at home with no work, right now is the time when you think to yourself, okay, what can I be doing to be creative? What can I do? Could I be making up masks? Because no matter what, everybody's gonna need a mask. Right. I'll be making up masks. Should I maybe, um, I don't know, could I be doing, taking dogs for a walk? Maybe I should be getting friendly with an old people's home and saying to them, look, maybe I could actually perform outside. All everyone could be inside, we could do a performance for you once a week outside, keeping our social distance. And where you sing to everybody inside because loneliness in an old people's home is a big thing. I just think you just need to get creative. Don't sit there waiting for things to happen because it's not going to come to you. No one's ever said to me, Derek, here you are, have this. It's always been on the basis of what I've been doing. They hear about it and they go, you know what? Motivator is the right person. Let me get him in. So, well, okay. One more thing on that point. It seems like, but the thing is that you've taken care of over years, obviously your health and yes. your, your, your emotional, as we were talking about, yes. so that when this happened, you were kind of prepared for it. You were, you were able to deal with all the challenges. <laughs> and I think most people were living paycheck to paycheck and maybe not as happy and not looking at all their emotional uh, aspects of their life. And this hit and all of those things were highlighted. And I think that's where you're seeing all these struggles. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. A lot of people weren't prepared. But that, the lesson we're all going to learn is that you can't put your, all your eggs in one basket. And you can't assume that your job is always going to be there. You're only as good as the last day you're in at work, right? Because when yeah. this pandemic came along, your job is still vulnerable. You right. could still be told, don't come into work tomorrow. So you should always, always have something else that you'd like to do. Maybe it's a hobby that you'd, and we've all got the time, come on. Yeah. You're only working between, if you're working between eight and eight, 
you've still got another 12 hours you could be doing something with, right? So what could you be doing? You could be starting a second career. You could maybe be an Uber driver. Maybe you could be a delivery guy. Maybe you should be getting in touch with Amazon and saying, look, I will start making deliveries for you. I don't know, but you should be thinking, where can I create or how can I create another pillow? And when we come through all this, that ammunition, that what you've just learned has got to be your mantra for the future. Do not depend on the one job you're in. No matter how good you think it is, no matter how many times you think it's going to last forever, it won't last forever. Well, and don't you think this is also a time to work on that emotional side so yes. that something comes like this, you're, you're prepared if you might be alone for a little bit or you might have whatever challenge it may be sure. that you're I, ready I think for that. All, I think we all need to emotionally analyze where we are. Now, it's, it's always been a bone of contention you know, who you love, who you love is your business, right? No one has any right to tell you, you can't love that person. Who you love, that's your business. Yeah. But if you, you don't have to be with someone to be happy because the stewardess on the airplane tells you, look after you put on your mask first before you help anybody else. That's what you've got to do with yourself. And that's not being selfish. That's how can you hope to help anybody if you're not well yourself? So sort yourself out. And that means strive for this emotional happiness, this balance in your life. And the balance comes from you being accepting of where you are, who you are. Look in the mirror and like who you see, right? But if you're working with other people, remember this, that if you work hard, if you're thoughtful and you're considerate and kind, then amazing things happen without you, without you even looking for it. It just happens. So, so Derek, where did Mr. Motivator come from? Um, you know, it was in 1989, there was a television show, kind of a morning show that went out at 10.30 in the morning. And I taught myself into actually appearing on this show. And I said, look, I can do fitness different to everybody else. Just give and it where, a chance. Where was this show? Was this in Jamaica in or UK. in the UK? In the UK, yeah. I've been in the UK since 1962. Oh, okay. I came here when I was 10. And so they sent me out into the marketplace and literally I'd walk into a shopping center with a roving camera and a mic and a music box. And I'd say to people, come on, come and work out with me. And uh, we'd get them to do all kinds of crazy things. But from that, I didn't get a, I didn't get a job. In 19, for, for 10 years up to 1993, I kept going down to this other morning show, which went out between six o'clock and nine o'clock in the morning, I'm begging them to give me a chance. And they kept saying, no, it won't happen. And then a new um, company took over the morning show. They were called Good Morning Television, GMTV. And I, by then I was training um, this lady who's very well known to do exercise. Uh, and it all came about because my classes were so popular. I would get people travel 25 miles to come to my classes. We'd have on a Tuesday night in a church hall, 150 people exercising. Wow. And this is 1989, 1990. Wow. It was just so, because my classes could be tough, but they were fun. You were laughing as much as you were working physically hard. She had heard about this class. She was a presenter on a TV show. And she asked me to come on and do some exercises with some men. So I went on, did the exercise. At the end of it, she says, look, would like to train me, be my personal trainer. I thought, why not? Not realizing she lived an hour away from me. So every day I get in my car and I drive all the way down to her home and I trained her. Wow. Before I knew it, the British Heart Foundation heard about my classes and said, look, would you like to go around the country talking to people about the benefits of exercise and doing exercise demonstrations? So I said, yes. So we had 20 cities that I went to. This is 1991. And I just talked to people about exercise and the benefits of it and how you should do it and what stuff like that. Before I knew it, I get invited to go on to another TV show where I was just going to be, it's a game show. And on the airplane going up, I met the guy who was the main presenter on the morning show. And he said, I'd heard about you through a lady that you're personally training. Would you like to come and train me? So I said, yes. So every morning I used to go down to the TV station on their students and I used to train this presenter in the gardens around from the TV center between any time he'd come out between six and nine o'clock. Right. And we did that. Before I knew it, all the presenters from the morning show started training with me. 
And so we'd be there at 9.30 training. And one day they were late coming down. So I was sitting in the reception at the studios waiting for them to come down. And there was a guy walking into the reception, had a very large belly. And I got up. I don't know to this day what came, what, how it happened. But I got yeah. up, I walked over to him and I prodded him in the belly. He said, what are you doing? Leave me alone. I said, you need to sort that belly out. He said, why are you hounding me? Leave me alone. And he went into the lift and went off. So I said to the receptionist, who was that guy? She said to me, he's the program controller of GMTV, the morning show. <laughs> so I said, which, which floor is his office in? She said, well, it's on the fifth floor. So the next day, I went in with my exercise bike and I wheeled in, got into the lift, went up to the fifth floor, pushed it into his office and ran off. The next day, I went back, knocked on his office and I said, excuse me, Mr. McHugh, you've got a bike in your office, you need to train. He said, why are you picking on me? I said, I found out you're the controller. You've got 250 people who work for you. You need to look after yourself. And I'm your man. He said, I don't have time. I said, if you don't make time, sir, you're not going to have time. I called his secretary in, and they booked me in the next week to come and train him on the Tuesday at 12 o'clock. Started training him. After about a month, he said, anybody who could persuade me to, to get fit can persuade the nation to get fit. He said, but I've been checking with the advertisers and they don't want to back a black guy doing fitness on television. This is 1993. They don't think it would work. And he said, but don't be disappointed because things have a way of changing. I know it's a long story, this. But one day I'm just oh, walking, one story. day I'm still waiting. Yeah, one day I went up to the offices to wait for the guys who were going to train. And I heard this lady on the phone speaking to the Key Fit Association of Great Britain saying, we'd like to bring you in to come and actually run the fitness on, on our channel. And I knelt down by the side of her right there and then I said, please don't, please listen to me. She put her phone down. I said, listen, give me a chance. She says, you must be that Derek Evans, uh, the piece of people they call the motivator. I said, yes. Uh, she said, well, I'm sorry, I've been told that the advertisers won't. I said, look, I can do it. She says, things have a way of changing. The next week she called me up. She said, look, the young girl who's been doing fitness on television is going on holiday. And the advertisers have said, you can come in and do your two week stint while she's away. And then we'll forget it after that. So I went in, did my two weeks. The very first morning I went on stage, the phone lines lit up. Everybody was phoning in, give us, give us more. By the Thursday, I came upstairs after coming off air and everybody in the office stood up and was applauding me like this. And they offered me a job and the rest is history. You know, so many people would have gotten upset or they would have taken it in such a, a negative way. And it seems like it motivated you. Absolutely right. You can turn every single negative into a positive. You don't have to have a chip on your shoulder about things. Everybody has a choice whether they're going to accept you or not. Right? I think there's a time when everybody will accept me. So I just keep waiting for that right moment. <laughs> That's all. I love it. I love it. Well, <laughs> we had the pleasure of working together. Um, and I, and I, I'll have to, to look it up what the museum was. We were at a museum. Yes. Barney and, and Mr. Motivator um, exercising for children. Yes. And it was, it was such a cool thing. And we'll put the pictures out there and I'll send you the pictures. Please, please. What is it like for you to work with kids, to, to exercise with kids and to motivate kids? I love kids. I used to present a show which went out on a Saturday morning. There were only two and a half minute items. They were filmed around the world. We'd go to Singapore and we'd film probably six two and a half minute items. And it was called Time Out with Mr. M. And it was all about the history and the culture of the place. And they would form the links to Power Rangers. Okay. So I had a real huge following of kids. And all those kids now are grown up. And they're the decision makers who give me all the work I get now. All my conference work, all my festival work, those are the people, right? And so and I love, the kids love Mr. Motivator. Right now, I mean, the school's asking me all the time to come in. And in your country, it's, it's so important that we engage them in that way. And I think that the Mr. Motivator character right? When he's dressed yeah. up in his suit and stuff. Yeah. Kids just love him. They love the bright colors, the music, the attitude, and they just want more of him. Well, we have, you know, especially over here, and I presume there too, with kids and, you know, video games and phones and computers and all those things. How do we, how do you get them off of that? How do you get them outside? How do you get them? How do you motivate them? Well, listen, every single one of us love incentives. I remember, you know, for my, for my son, uh, who's my middle child, 
Yeah. All right. I said, look, if you got the following grades, you're going to get a new bike or you're going to get this. So what do you really want? And you go, well, I want a PS3 or whatever it is. Okay. That's what you're going to get. Everyone loves incentives. I right. believe the way to deal with kids is to have it say if they do something, they earn a badge or they earn something that goes into a booklet that they can actually redeem that booklet for something else. You want it to be something that actually gets the parents to have to look over them when they're doing it. Um, it's got to be things like, you know, every hour, there's, an, there's a watch that you wear, which goes off every hour. And every hour, as part of your challenge, you've got to run on the spot for, for 20 seconds and you've got to do 20 star jumps, right? And once right. you've done that, your, your parents stick a sticker in your book, right? And your book fills up. I believe that's the only way to do it. And, and, and in the schools, right, what we need to do is we need to make physical education fun. It needs to be done yeah. with music and movement and laughter. It doesn't want to be something where some kids don't want to run 10 miles. Right. Once they get put off running 10 miles, they put off exercise forever. Right. But if you get them doing something which is enjoyable and fun and make it that it's creative play, right, they're more likely to gravitate towards it. Yeah, because it, it, it can it become a chore. And we were talking about this before we got on, that you can't make someone do something. No. If they don't want to do it, they're not going to do it. They have to want to do it. Right. No, but I mean, at the end of the day, when my, I remember as a child, if my parents wanted me to eat vegetables, they'd cook it up in a pie and disguise it so I could eat it. So what we do is we don't say to kids, you must get fit. Right. We don't say to kids, right, that you have to exercise. We do a, something which is so much fun, they don't realize. I mean, I was promoting recently a, an exercise regime using these bouncers. The kids, once they get on the bouncers, would never come off. They'd be pouring with perspiration. Why? because they think it's fun. And that's the important thing. Fun, play, that's all you have to do. That's the secret. <laughs> now, now for adults, I think it's always hard to get started, right? We, we're a society, we, we want it to happen now, and it, it doesn't. It's gonna take a moment when you start fitness again. How do you, how do you keep them, well, you know, you know their expectations in, in check? You know something? All that I can do with adults is remind them of the messages because yeah. every adult knows what's right and wrong. We, as we said before, they know all about when they've overeaten, when they've right. drunk too much. You know, if, when they go on to that other drink, they know they're going to wake up tomorrow with a headache. Yeah. When they have that extra sausage or whatever it is, right, they know they're going to feel like they've overdone it. So they know already. All we have to do is get them to understand that this life you have the quality of your life improves the moment you get far more active. Exercise, there's a curative power to exercise where it can slow down the rate of any condition that you may have, the rate of deterioration, or if you have to have an operation, it helps you to recover much quicker. So, you know, we all need to look after ourselves in that way and, and just recognize that it doesn't take much. You know, I mean, look, I mean, I, I say I exercise every day. And some days I'm having to do, like yesterday I did about two hours because not only did I do my workout in the morning with my wife, but then I had to do, there's a friend of mine who's just had a kidney transplant. So I've got him on an exercise regime because it's really important for him that he keeps movement going. And then I had to do a company, a 30 minute exercise class with his company. And then I did another company uh, last night, which went out all over Canada and Portugal for this company for another 30 minutes. So I did about two hours of exercise yesterday. But you know what? I may ache like crazy the next day, but I know I'm putting in the, into the exercise bank stuff that I can call on when I need it. And, and is that, you know, you get, I think there's times that you feel like, you know, you're so restricted. Is that how you allow yourself if you want to have dessert or you want to have this and that? Absolutely right. Absolutely right. But you see, what I do is I treat myself. Once a month, I have some chocolate. I love chocolate and plain uh, we call it crisps. What do you call it? You, bags of, um, is it, you know, you call it fries, don't you? Bags of, is it fries? What is it? Fries are chips. Chip. They is come in a bag? Yeah, chips. You call it chips? Yeah, we call, yeah. All right, chips. Okay, fine. Call it the same thing. Like potato sure. chips. Potato chips, yeah. yeah. So once a month, I'll have that with some chocolate. <laughs> right? That's once a month. That's my discipline, right? I, I, I just think every, every time you treat yourself in that way, whatever you're eating, always tastes so good. Right. Whereas if you have it regular, you've lost the magic behind everything. So it's that, it's that apple pie and ice cream. You have it once a month, right? It tastes good. It's, um, I'm the one who cooks in my home. Oh. So like last night I did uh, some Alfredo um, with um, 
um, pasta and Alfredo pasta with um, some salmon and stuff like that last night with lots of broccoli, right? I do the cooking, but I won't have the once a week we'll have that, you know? So with everything in life, you want to moderate. You just don't want to just have it every day because it takes away the magic. And guess what? It tastes so much better when you don't have it that often. And always leave the table half hungry, right? Uh, if you do that, you'll find that, you know, number one, you'll cut down on the amount of stuff you intake and your stomach will shrink and therefore you will lose weight if you want to lose weight. What is your favorite exercise? Um, I love dancing. So, you know, just put on any kind of funky music and I'm just gone. I mean, my wife and I like that, like that, crazy like that. And so music plays a big part. You will never come to my home and find music's not playing. But I, I listen to everything from classical music through to African music, really. If the beat's good, it, it, it's, it's great for me. Yeah. It, but isn't, it's funny you say that. I mean, that can be your exercise, right? It doesn't oh, have sure. to be traditional. No, for sure. Dancing is wonderful exercise. And it's also a great way of meeting other people. And every single person older than 45, I say this to you now, you need to take up a hobby that gets you meeting other people. Because a circle of life is like this. You start out in your 20s, you may think I've got loads and loads of friends. In your 30s, the amount of friends gets smaller and smaller. When you get to your 50s, it's smaller. When you get to your 60s, there are fewer around. When you get to your 70s, maybe some of the person you've been married to or living with, right, who's around. And when you get to your 80s, the chances are you're probably on your own. There's only a head in the corner bobbing up and down. Right. So by going and taking up these kind of social activities, you form a, a friendship outside of your normal circle, which gives you other people that you can relate to. And forging long-term friendship means getting away from your Facebook, getting away from social media, right? And going out there and physically interact, go for walking groups with people where maybe every weekend you're doing a walk that takes you to a place that's interesting. But what's it doing? It's giving you exposure to other people. And that's the way you've got to look at life because the circle of life means at some stage or other, you'll be on your own, on your own unless you take those steps. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting you say that because right now I think you're seeing it a lot with seniors. Um, this is a very, very difficult time because you know they're being kept away from people. Yes, and, they are. and you know, and you retire, and and now you're in a, a pandemic. I know, I know. The thing, the thing about it is that when it comes to seniors, you know, every single family that's well to do, as soon as they have a senior in their home, they very often want to put them into a home anyhow. Yeah. And I think that's so wrong. So that's why I say to every single person, it's never too late. Fight for your independence, and the way you increase your independence, so at least you can at least do the very the necessary things, whether it's washing yourself, or whatever it is, is to ensure that you get as physical as you can. And that means going for walks. If there's stairs, going up the stairs as often as you can. You can always take the lift coming down because that's not too good for you. But walking up the stairs, going for walks, find a friend, meet your friend down the road. When you're going for a walk, don't go around the block because every time you pass your home, you get tempted to go indoors. Walk away from your home for 15 minutes. That means you've got to walk back for 15 minutes. Challenge yourself. Walk between two lamp posts, light posts, and then, and then quicken up your pace between the next two. But make it exercise interesting. But do it now because it will pay dividends in the end. Well, and, and the other one, I, I'm curious your thoughts. So many people go to, to the news. And obviously, I, I believe that the news is important to a point. But hearing that bad news every day with everything going on can really affect you mentally. That's why what you got to do is follow Mr. Motivator because I'm only into positive stuff, stuff that's going to make you feel good, right? Because you're right. The bad news is always on the front page of every newspaper. Yeah. It's always the news that happens on the hour. You'll hear it on the hour. So therefore, seek out a good music station, which is classical music or jazz music, and listen to that. Stay away from the news. You know exactly what the news is going to be about. And then if you find time, get the Mr. Motivator book, the warm-up. I must send you a copy of this, right? I That's want it. it. I want it, and we will promote it. Thank you. Right. Of but course. there you go. It's called the warm-up. And it tells you everything. And the way I've written, you know, i tell you how this came about. I went to, it's many years ago, I went to the four weddings and a funeral. It was the um, opening night. And Richard Curtis, who wrote 
the, the film and he was a part of the production team. Mm -hmm. He said to me, Motivator, everybody in Britain wants to know where you come from because all of a sudden there you are on our screens making us laugh, making us happy. Right? He said, everybody wants to write your book. But when you write your book, don't start with, I was born. He said, because if you do that, everybody knows the ending. What you must do is start with where you are and then go back. And that way you keep the reader interested in it. And that's how I wrote it. It was really difficult because to keep going back and coming forward, because, you know, you remember things from the past in so many different lights. You know, you may be in a room upstairs and you remember something from the past. And when you're down here, you see it differently. And when I spoke to my wife, for example, she was in the same location when something happened, but she saw it differently. Where did, where did the workout clothes come from? If anyone, if you haven't seen it, they're very colorful. Where, where did this come from? I'm going to send you some pictures as well of it. You know what? Every single January, I, I get an airplane, get to um, Miami. And downtown Miami, there is a fabric store that has 15,000 different bright colored fabrics for swimwear. And I choose enough for 50 outfits. Then I go to Jamaica, and I've got a guy in Jamaica who makes up all my suits and stuff like that. And there, they're it. They're it. I love it. Derek, I haven't stopped smiling the, the whole time. It Thank has you. been such a pleasure. I'm motivated once again. Uh, I try to be a pretty upbeat person, but I think you've even you've made me even <laughs> more upbeat. Thank you, Mason. No, it's been a pleasure talking to you, all right? Derek, it's just been such a pleasure. Thank you so much, and keep motivating people. My pleasure. And before I go, I always finish with a life lesson. Yes. Right? with every interview I do. And here's the one for you. All right. It's the term I've coined, I'm flawsom. Now, flawsome means an individual who embraces their flaws and still know that they're awesome, regardless. That is flawsome. I love it. Thank you so much. My pleasure, mate. Thank you so much for watching Purple Roads. Yeah. Remember to keep your eyes, ears, and your heart open, and you'll find your Purple Road. We'll see you next week. Now we're going swimming. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Do it. Uh-huh. Watch me. Now you're going to shoot the ball. Shoot that ball. Let's go. Let's go. Yes. 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 Do it. Do it. Oh, I'm not going to be. 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 Oh,